we've been talking about the word love on Wednesday night for about 130 weeks because this has been the most misconstrued, destroyed word in the Scriptures. If you watch Oprah or if you watch Donahue or if you watch Geraldo, inevitably when someone gets up in one of their audiences and says, uh, well, if someone says something about abortion or someone says something about homosexuality, and let me say this, the homosexual does not need to repent of homosexuality. He needs to repent, period. If he just repents of homosexuality, he's going to have all those other sins in his life. And we don't need to repent just of one sin. We need repentance in our lives, and that means to turn away from self to God. And repent means to turn from self and to be obedient to the Word of God. The word repent is the word metanoia. I don't know how I got in this. Meta, N-O-I-A, metanoia. And it means to be turned around and go another direction. You're going away from God. God turns you around. And Jeremiah said, Lord, if you turn me, I will be turned. And that's the only way I will turn. And after you're turned, there's three things that will happen. You'll be ashamed. If you're not ashamed of your sin and your past, if, you, if you're unwilling to be confounded, which means to be humiliated, and you're unwilling to take the blame or the reproach for your youth, then you are not repentant. And by the way, Jesus said, except a man repent, he'll perish. And the word repent is what we call present tense, subjunctive mood. And present tense, subjunctive mood always means continually over and over and over and over and over. Or it means constant and that takes us to the word love because the word love is directly related to the word predestinate. And a man has no ability to turn himself. Jeremiah said, I can't turn myself. I can't be ashamed on my own. I cannot, uh, I cannot be humiliated. I'm not willing to and I'm not willing to take the blame unless God deals with my heart. Why is that? Because we are totally 100% completely depraved. There's not one ounce of good in us. Not one ounce of good anywhere in us. So whenever... And when he said present tense subjunctive, that means constant. What Jesus said, except you continually repent and you can't do it, it's me that's working in you. Why? Because there's none good. There's none righteous. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. And every man... Psalms 39 and 5... Every man at his very best state, this is everyone who's ever lived that's living today, everyone who has ever existed other than Jesus Christ, every man at his very best state is altogether vanity. He is a zero without the rim. You're a zero. Let's just race the rim, and that's what you are. Nothing. And that's what I am. So therefore, if God does not cause us to love Him, and that word love doesn't mean what people think it means. Now, it's very important that we believe in predestination. Why? Why is it so comforting to believe in predestination? The ordination of God's ordinary arrangement for His children is good. Now, the word good, when we see the word good, there's two words in the Greek for the word good, and there's one particular word, the word tobe, and it's pronounced T-O-V-E, or tov, or tobe. That's which pronounced. Tobe, that word, when God would do something in the first chapter of Genesis, and He would move the earth, and He would separate uh, the elements, and He would separate the, the waters that were above the firmament from the waters that were under the firmament, and He would say it is good. That is that word. And that word good doesn't mean nice. The word good, the word tove, it actually is what is to be. It is what is to be, and the word good means beneficial. Now that is the Old Testament word. That's the Old Testament word for the New Testament word, A-G-A-T-H-O-S. Now that word agathos is what God does in our lives. Romans 8, 28. Let me quote it very slowly. Most people quote it wrong. Romans 8 and 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good, for agathos, beneficial. All things work together. 
I'll get it in a minute. Spell wrong when I go to when I go to talking while I'm spelling. All things work together for our benefit. How many things? All good things? Well, yes. All bad things? Well, yes. Oh, yes. What we think are bad things are not bad things. Why is that? Well, Isaiah 45 and 7 says... What is Isaiah 45 and 7? The Lord said, I make light in darkness, I make peace, and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all things. I do it all. You say, but I thought God couldn't be touched with evil. That's why He created a servant named Satan. And Satan is not a co-god. And he is not equal to God. And there's no chance that he's going to overthrow God. How many people can Satan take to hell? As many as God will let him take to hell. And how much evil can Satan do? The amount of evil that God will let him do. You know what Satan is? He's like one of them old chisels that they used to use on a lathe. And they'd have a lathe and they'd have a little point here or somehow. They'd have a, you'd put a little piece of wood in there. And then on the other end, you'd have a point here and the wood would be there. And the lathe would begin to spin. And you take a chisel and you carve it up. And Satan is like God's chisel. He's God's termite. He says, you can bore here, now stop. <laughs> and what he does, he carves out a beautiful piece of God's work. That's what he does. And when he's through, he's got this beautiful thing. People say, well, I don't like that. Well, it's not a matter of whether we like it or not. You remember Job? Satan came before Job. Job said, and Satan said, the Lord said to Satan, he said, hast thou considered my servant Job? And he was richer than any man of the East. And he was a just man that eschewed evil. Satan said, well, certainly he's, certainly he's, uh, He's worshiping you. Look at the heads you've built around him. And the Lord said, well, you can take everything he's got, except don't touch his body. That belongs to me. So what does the Bible say? It says, these said it, as soon as Satan began to do his work, the Scripture says that God allowed Satan into Job's life, and the Scripture tells us that it was the fire of of God that fell from heaven that allowed Satan to do his evil deeds. Right. It was not the fire of Satan. It was the fire of God. And as one servant would come and say, uh, your, your men were over there uh, taking care of your camels and your sheep, and the Sabians came in and fell upon them and took them all away and slew all your servants, and I only am left alone to tell thee. And then he would go on down the road, and he would say, uh, your servants were over here doing these things, and and... Uh, some thieves would come in and run off with them and he'd say, I'm alone left to tell thee. And while this was in his mouth, he said a great wind came and blew up on the house where your children were and killed your seven sons and three daughters. <sighs> yes, and then what happened? Job said, naked came out from my mother's womb. And he said, I'll return naked to the ground with nothing. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name, the Shem of the Lord. That word Shem is the word name and it means authority. And God's authority is His commandment. And what does the next verse say? People say Job was out of his mind. No, he was not. God said in the very next verse, he said, in all this, Job sinned not with his lips, nor charged God foolishly. All right. Now, God said, you're right. I killed your sons and daughters. And Job said, blessed be the authority of God that slew my children and took all of my substance. Because God knows what he's doing in the next chapter. Satan said, well, you still got his body. Let me have his body. God said, you can touch his body, but you can't have his life. So Satan went and struck Job from the crown of his head to the toe of his feet. And his wife came and said, Why don't you curse God and die? She didn't say, Why don't you curse Satan? She said, God did this to you. And what did Job's answer to her? He said, Woman, you speak like one of the foolish women speaketh. Shall we receive good and shall we not receive evil at the hand of the Lord? And the next sentence says, In all this Job sinned not with his lips. 
God said, let me verify that statement. Job did not sin nor charge me with something I didn't do. Satan is God's devil. He's God's servant. And the only thing he can do is what God lets him do. And if we can get it into our heads, the reason for predestination, the reason for predestination is so we can relax and calm down, get calm and be still. You remember, you see, God is in charge of this whole show. And so we can sila. C-E-L-A-H. And the word sila means stop, stand still and ponder this. And that was used. That word sila was used continually. All through, the, all through the Psalms, when David would say, My enemies are surrounding me, but my God will deliver me. Selah. He was saying, Rest. That's a, you know what that is? That is a musical rest or a pause. He says, Now you stop and you think about this very clearly. You remember when we, we preached about this when we were talking about Moses and the children of Israel came up against the Red Sea? And then the sea was before them. And here's what we do. We do like some of the children of Israel did. The sea was in front of them. And the Egyptians were behind them with their chariots. And there was a great pillar of fire that kept them from getting to Moses. And some of the people were going, oh, oh, what are we going to do? Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. Just relax. Just be still. It doesn't matter if the roof is caving in. That's in God's hand. If somebody hits you in a car, some guy took the side out of my car one time, had a brand new car, and took the whole side out of it, and I got out very calmly and said, Well, look at that. Look what the Lord did. And one lady said, Oh, you, you seem to be in shock. Are you? I said, That's what God did. Uh, John, could you run me over to the house? And I was just very calm. I said, look at that. God must have something else He wants me to do. And do you realize that when you have a wreck, you, when you have a wreck, a car wreck, you get a ticket, you get a flat tire. Do you realize every step of the rest of your life is going to be different? And ten years down the road, you'll meet some guy at Kmart, and you'll become the dearest of friends, and you'll find out that both of you have something in common about Christ, and you may end up going somewhere on some missionary journey together, and you say, the Lord brought us together in Kmart the five minutes that I was going to be there, and the five minutes that you were going to be there, not without that flat tire ten years before you wouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. Not without that flu that you had the summer, the winter before that slowed you down and put every step in your life different than it would have been. That's why Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, I know, Solomon, look at it. Let's go over to Ecclesiastes 3.14. Ecclesiastes 3.14. Tonight we're talking about why... It is so comforting for the believer to believe in predestination. Now, you don't really believe in predestination unless you relax. Oh, me. <laughs> you got to sit back. And this is the importance of it. Look here in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14. This is one of my favorite verses. I know. This is Solomon speaking. He says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Now, everything that God is doing is forever. Now, let me show you on the board. Forever did not mean to the Hebrew mind what it means to us. What it means to us is from now on. That is not the word forever to the Hebrew. The word, the, the word forever is the word everlasting. In the Greek, it's the word forever. It is the word world without end. Now, in the Hebrew, it's the word O-W-L-A-M. And in the Greek, it's the word A-I-O-N-O-S. Ionos. And both of them mean it always has been and it always will be because God does not exist in time. He exists in eternity and there is no time with God. All things are now. Now let's read it. I know that whatsoever God doeth shall be forever. It always has been. It always will be. And nothing can be put to it. Me and Billy talked the other night. Billy just struggling with some things in life. My heart goes out to him and to Novit and some others. 
There's some people here, and Mark's been having some really hard times. <laughs> Mark don't have any struggles. Either. And my heart goes out to these, to Latoya and to Micah. But let me tell you something. When you go, I've been, I've laid flat on my face and cried for 10 years. But that's okay. And I'm not saying it's not supposed to hurt. Let it alone. It's of God. Nothing is out of the hand of God in the believer's life. That's why we know that all things work together for good. Leave it alone and relax. That's what God wants us to do, is just stand still and know that He's God. What did He do with it? Moses? He said, be still, Moses. The salvation is in me. I'm going to do the deliverance from your enemies. You're not going to do it. Stand still, be still, and be quiet. And pay attention to me. But see, we hop around and bounce around. Well, I don't think God wants. Yes, He does. He wants whatever happens. Didn't he create the universe? Didn't he create Satan? Why is it that Satan, he created Satan or Lucifer, one of the archangels with a glitch? And why is it that he didn't create Michael or Gabriel with a glitch? Why is it they're going to be here eternally? Why is it Satan had a defect and he fell? Because God created him that way and he wanted him to fall. He has a purpose. Now look here. Now look here. Could God have made him perfect? Couldn't he have just made all of us perfect in the beginning? Why did he do that? What if God willing to show his wrath and make his power known? He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction that he might make known upon the vessels of mercy his glory. And he's a fore prepared us unto glory. He is a fore prepared poetoi mazo. He has fitted us up in advance. He is pre-prepared us. That's what that word proeto amado means. It means to fit up beforehand. Now look here, he says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. You can't add anything to it. You can't pray and get a job. You can't pray that cancer will go away. Why? That ain't prayer. No, no. That ain't prayer. Now, the word, now prayer... The New Testament words of the word prayer is the word P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. That word pro, prosuchomai, it comes from pros, meaning forward, forward. And the word E-U-C-H-E, and that word E-U-C-H-E means to will. That means to will oneself forward. We don't know how to pray. <laughs> Do we? No, we don't. We don't even know what... Didn't Paul say in Romans 8, we know not what to pray for as we ought? And didn't Jesus say in the 6th chapter of Matthew, I know what things you have need of before ye ask. Ask is a legal word. That was a legal word. It is the word A-I-T-E-O. I-T-E-O. Now, Mr. Thayer tells us in his... Uh, let me read you. I wrote the definition from Thayer's. Up in the front of my Bible. Thayer says... That asking, he said it, it is, we do not ask for things, what we ask for is the will of God. Mr. Thayer says it is to signify to ask for something to be given, not done, giving prominence to the thing asked for. Now, it's not literal things that we ask for, and I'll show you in a moment. Rather than the person, and hence is rarely used in exhortation, it's very seldom used in comforting someone. Mm. Mm. The use of the word may and therefore be viewed as having relation to the manner and the cast of the request, namely, when carrying a certain freedom of aim and bearing. Now here is where the, here's where the character comes from. 1 John 3 and 22. He tells us how you get what you ask. We receive the things that we ask if we do two things. Keep His commandments. Keep His commandments. And do those things, do those things, things that are pleasing, that are pleasing in His sight. Now, how do we keep His commandments? All of the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And it is this word, A-G-A-P-E. 
Now, it is not the word P-H-I-L-E-O. These, the, these are the two common words in the New Testament for the word love. The word phileo, we get the word philia from that, P-H-I-L-I-A. That is the word friend. And then we get from that, we get the word P-H-I-L-O-S. That means to be, to be fond of. And he did not use any of those words when he said, love your neighbors yourself. He used the word agape. Agape is an ancient word that predates Christ. Some of the writers, Mr. Kittle tells us it predates Christ approximately 2,500 years. They don't know exactly where it started, but they do know that agape means it's the relationship between a king and his subjects or between a husband and his wife. Now, if you love your wife, you'll do things for her. If you love your husband, you'll do things for him. I told Mike the other day, I said, I don't wash the dishes because I've been a, I, because uh, Mary jumps all over and tells me, you've got to wash the dishes. Washing dishes is not woman's work. I don't know if anybody thinks that or not. I'm the dishwasher in this house. I am self-appointed. I am the vacuumer upstairs. I'm self-appointed. And if I love my wife, I will help her and I will do the things that will take, I'll do the things that will take the pressure off of her. And if you love the king, you will keep his commandments. Now, that relationship between the king and his commandments had to do... The king wouldn't give the, wouldn't give the people commandments that were too grievous, that he, they, they could not bear. And that's why he says, over there in 1 John 2 and 3, that, that, to, that when we love Christ... That we walk in His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. And the word grievous is the word baras, and it means they are not heavy. They are easy to bear. Why? Because we understand predestination and the ordination of God, and we keep His commandments. What are His commandments? His law. His law. That's right. The law wasn't nailed to the cross with Christ. Oh, no, most is the word law. All the law is fulfilled in agape. We walk in the commandments of God. The law was not done away with. Only the handwriting of ordinances. Only the rituals of the law. Now, we're Jews of the heart. We're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. We are a spiritual priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifice. We're kings and priests. We're the house of God. The house of God was the Holy of Holies, and that's where he came down and dwelt between the cherubim. The word dwelt means to house. We've talked about how we're the veil of the temple. The veil was his flesh. We enter in by a new and living hadas. The word hadas is the word way, the new and living way. Jesus said, I am the way. And he said, I am the hadas. No man comes to the Father but by me, this one hadas. And he said, narrow is the hadas. And the word narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O. And that means pressure, tribulation. And Paul said we must, through much Talibo, enter into the kingdom of God. So we enter into, we enter into the holiest by a new and living Hadass, by Christ. That's how we enter in. And he said we enter in through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. In John 6th chapter, starting about the 51st verse, he said his flesh is the bread. Mm. The bread is the body. The body is the church. And the bread is the church too. Paul said, we being many are one bread. So we're the veil, we're the temple, we're the candlesticks in Revelation 1 and 20. We are the, the showbread. We're the pierced bread. That, that showbread was called the bread of the orderly arrangement. For God so loved the world, so as an adverb tells how or in what fashion He loved. Adverbs tell how, when, or where, and they modify it. Uh, verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs, and I learned that in the fifth grade and never did forget it. That's not some theological thing you have to go to college to learn. So is an adverb. Talks about how or in what fashion he loved his world, loved the world, and word world is the word cosmos, and it means orderly arrangement, and it don't matter whether we like that or not, that's what it means. It means orderly arrangement. Now, what is he arranged? He's arranged everything after the counsel of his own will. That's why relax. Don't worry. I mean, don't matter if you have a wreck. 
It don't matter if you get cancer. You can't go back to Ecclesiastes 3.14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it has always been in the mind of God, and it always will be, and you can't add anything to it. You can't get a job that He hadn't planned for you. Oh, love Him. You can't... <laughs> Lord help us. You can't get the woman that he don't want for you. You might get one for a while, but that's the one he wants you to have right then. You can't pray something away or pray something in or out because prayer means to will forward. It means to bow to the will of God. We have to keep his commandments. What are his commandments? There's something called an imperative mood in the Greek. And every time, it's, it's a command. It's the same thing as saying, it's the same thing as God saying, let there be light. That's a commandment of God. And, every, and the light doesn't say, well, I just don't know if I want to be. If y'all don't sing 25 verses of just as I am, maybe I will decide to be. Or Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Well, I don't know if I want to come forth. When Jesus, the God of the universe, says, come forth, He's given His sheep spiritual ears. He said, My sheep, hear My voice. And we were His sheep from the foundation of the world. And sheep have got sheep ears. Let me show you something about this. Let's look at this and let me show you something here. You've got you to gotta keep His commandments. That imperative, that imperative is a commandment. When He said, Strive to enter the straight gate. The word strive is the word agonizomai. It is our word agonize. Agonize entering in. Agonize through the hadas, the narrow gate, the narrow way. And the word narrow means tribulation. We go through the straight gate. The word straight is the word stenos, S-T-E-N-O-S. And that means to press through a narrow opening. Now everyone that gets into heaven presseth, B-I-A-Z-O. That word biazo has the same meaning as straight, has the same meaning as narrow. The word biazo, every man presses into the kingdom, and it means to crowd and to be afflicted. <laughs> it's the same word when he said over there in Matthew, when he said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, it suffereth biazo. And we press into it. And we violently get violent with ourselves. And over there in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, Paul said... If I don't bring my body into subjection, subjection is the word dulo gageo. Glenn woke up. We talk about a lot of Greek words here, and I was talking to Mark today. I said, if you keep coming, I'll pound these Greek words at you till you get a hold of them. Glenn woke up one day, our, our producer back here, runs the camera and sells the shows and sells the TV, and he woke up one day and he called me and said, what's dulo gageo? <laughs> <laughs> The L-U, L-G-E-O. That word dulagoegeo is that word in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27 where Paul said, if I don't bring my body in subjection, it means to enslave yourself. It means to force yourself to do right. That's what it means. Now, repentance is not just, gosh, this is so easy. God's turned me around. Here I go. And I just feel good about it. Let me tell you, repentance don't ever feel good in the flesh. It does not feel good. I asked Eric, my son, Eric's 26, and I said, Eric, have you thought repentance is something God will rain down on you one day? And you'll say, gosh, I want to give up sin. I don't want to do it no more. He said, yeah. I said, no, that ain't what it is. It's God dealing with your heart till you know you have to do right, even though you'd rather still do wrong. Mm -hmm. You still want to do wrong. You still want to sin. You say, I must behave myself. I must quit playing. I must quit seeking myself. I must. I've got to enslave myself. Otherwise, he said, you are a... What, what did he say he was? Somebody tell me. Castaway. Castaway. What is that word? Adokimas. A-D-O-K-I. I I told you you'd learn these, Mark, if you come. Uh, dokimas, it comes from dokimazo. Dokimazo is the word try, trial. It's the fire, it's the fiery trial. And when you place the alpha, it's called the alpha privata in the Greek. You place the alpha in front of it, it, it negates the word, gives you a, a totally opposite meaning. It means worthless. Same word. Thank you, Glenn. Reprobate. Same word, reprobate. It means worthless. And what's another word for worthless? 
Somebody tell me. Yeah. And what is what is that word? Kokos. K A K O S. And that means worthless. You are evil if you don't do. You're evil if you don't do the will of God and force yourself to behave yourself and do right. Well, I thought you said only God can turn you. Let me tell you what. Only God can put that little seed in your heart that makes you want and force you to say, I'd rather do this, but let me turn the TV off and quit watching the evening movie and let me read my Bible. And let me get bored a while till I get into it. Huh? Hello. <laughs> What's that? That gets hold of me. It's forcing yourself to do what you'd rather when you'd rather be doing something else. You know what that is? Faith. That's what it is. That's faith. That's death to self. It's turning for your own desires and saying, God, I must now. We got to do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Pleasing. What is well pleasing to God? Can somebody tell me what that is? You are Oh, Now we know what you means. We find it in the word eulogy. E U L O G Y. It comes from E U L O G O S. You well words lagos. Well lagos. Now the word you arresto means well. What is this word? Pleasing. And where do we find that? Romans 12, Romans 12, 1. 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. Well, pleasing, acceptable. Now, we must give our bodies a living sacrifice, well, pleasing. Where do we give this sacrifice? How do we do it? Let me put it that way. We die. What do you use for dying? Huh? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. The cross. Well, let's go back. Let me show you something. When you bring your body into subjection, what you're doing is obeying the Word of God. Now, I was raised in an independent Baptist preacher's home, and I heard a million times, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, that's a wonderful, wonderful word. And grace is unmerited favor. It's the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, C-H-A-R-I-S. And we get the word C-H-A-R-A from that, and that's the word joy, joy. And grace is, uh, is this is grace. And the word C-H-A-I-R-O comes from that. And the Bible says if some... If anybody brings any other doctrine than the doctrine of Christ, don't bid them God speed. That's that word caro over there in 2 John uh, 10 through 12. And if you bid them God speed, you're partaker of their evil deeds. And that word caro means, what does it mean? God speed is cheerful. Cheerful, yeah. Don't be cheerful to them. Don't be joyful to them. Don't be gracious to them if they don't bring God's doctrine of death to self. Do not. We're not supposed to be nice to people. That's not true. Nice is the word me scare. It means no knowledge. And David that called me last night, he said, and he said, I went to such and such a church and the preacher, and the preacher was real nice. And I said, nice, that's the word me scare. He said, oh yeah, you're the one that I heard say that. Yeah. And they scare. He said, I went to my dictionary and looked it up and it said ignorant. Yeah. That's what it means. It means, nay, it's C-E-R-E, it's a French word. It means no knowledge. This is the word science. Science. You find in the, in the New Testament, it's the word G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis. Scientific things have some exact knowledge to it. Knowledge. And my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And when you act nice, you act dumb, you act ignorant, and you are a hypocrite. Love. Let me tell you what, everybody knows the truth that has an IQ, an average IQ or above. The only way you can literally be nice is by having an IQ of about 60 and be a mongoloid. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you act nice and you act dumb, you're in trouble with God. Don't you be, we can't be cheerful to people who act dumb and say, gosh, I don't know. Say yeah, the kid. Don't the parents say, "Act nice." Don't let people know how you really. Yeah, don't know, don't let people know how you are, really are. Now we're talking about faith. For by grace you say through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
Grace, the gracious gift of God is faith. And we're saved through, and the word through is the word D-I-A, dia. And the word dia means a channel. What if I said a way? Way? And it's like, it is a channel, it's like a tunnel that you go into and you can't back up. And you have to stay in it because once you get into it, God requires it of all of His people. And you have to stay dying. Now, faith is directly related to the word predestinate. Of course, the word predestinate is the word pro or izio. Pro meaning before. And orizo is the word, is the Jewish word for our word, H-O-R-I-Z-O-N. He has pre-horizoned us to walk in the kingdom of light, to walk in the light because the horizon is Horus. Horus is an ancient word for the sun. He is pre-sun zoned us, and that's a Latin word, horizon. The Jewish word was horizo, and it means he's pre-lightened us. What's the light? It's called truth, and truth is not something you merely assent to. You do, but you don't have any ability to do it. How are you going to do it? If God don't lighten you, if He don't plant the seed which is Christ in your heart, you don't have any ability to do right, not before you come to Christ or not after. Right. Now, predestination is not fatalism. We are predestinated to conform to the image of His Son. And the word conform is the word sumorphos, S-U-M, M-O-R, P-H-O-S. We get the word morphosis from that. It means to be fashioned or shaped, a metamorphosis. When a grasshopper goes through a metamorphosis or a caterpillar, it turns from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Now, we don't turn into spiritual beings. We're birthed in or inside. And he insists that these bodies walk righteously and be like Christ that we live in. That's called obedience. That's called faith. We are elected. First Peter 1 and 2, we are elect unto obedience. And you know what that is? Faith. Remember Ephesians 2.8? By grace you are saved through faith, through the channel of faith. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You remember over there in Philippians, Philippians 1.29, Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon Him, but also to suffer for His sake. What is that suffering? It's that hadas we go through. It is that biadzo, that pressing into... That pressing into the kingdom. It's the hadas, the way, Jesus, and that way is narrow. And Paul said, that's the word philebo, and Paul said after he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra, we must through much philebo. Much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now that philebo, that was a severe whipping. Now, how does he make us do that? I said this. Was that you I said to you today? I don't know who it was. Ephesians 1 and 4. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. He didn't just choose us to get in the gate of heaven. Nobody has any ability to do good and do right. He didn't choose us just to get in and be a fatal predestinationist. We don't believe predestination quite like anybody else. We believe it for what it is. That we should be Haggai? Yes, that we should be Haggai. <laughs> but yeah, can y'all tell he's been around here a long time? He sits there and there makes tapes night and day. He has to make all these tapes and he's, his stuff is banging Glenn's brains out. Now, Haggai, he's predestined us to be H-A-G-I-O-S. And the word Hallowed, the word Hallowed is the same word as sanctify. It's the word H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. It is the verb form. Think of sanctify is the verb form of holy. It's what it is. This is the verb. This is the noun. Holy means single or pure in substance. Let me tell you something. Gold ore is not worth a nickel when you, when you dig it out of the ground if you don't ever put it into a fire. And when you get when you get the gold ore, you got to turn the, start turning the heat up. And the higher you turn the heat, first the lesser metals burn out, zinc and copper and and some of the cheaper metals. And then one of the last things that burns out is nickel or then silver, 
And then what's left is gold. And the best metallurgists tell us that gold can't even be scorched. The hotter you get the gold, the purer it gets and the softer it gets and the more malleable it becomes. And God can use us and shape us then. Mm. That's what He is. What is He predestinated for? For the fire. He's chosen us to be holy. How do we become holy? He said... My son, be not. He says, don't be disturbed about the chastening of the Lord for whom the Lord loveth. He chastens and scourges. The word scourges is the word M A S T I X. And it comes from the word master God, O M A S T I G O O. And that's the Roman flagellum. And they bring it down on a man's back and it would kill most men. God said, I beat my children with bloody whipping because ain't no good in them. Paul said, how to perform that which is good is not in me. Here I am, a writer of 14 books of the New Testament. One more or less. We won't argue that. Here I am, a writer of 14 books of the New Testament. And how to perform, how to capture Gazzam, K-A-T-E-R, G-A-Z-O, M-A-I. How to capture Gazzam, I don't know how. Paul said in Philippians 2 and 12, work out, capture Gatsumai, your own salvation, and work out is an imperative command. And Paul said, I can't do that. How's it going to get done? Verse 13, uh, the second chapter, the very next verse, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says in the next verse, verse 13, Philippians 2, it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Everything He's doing in your life, you can't put anything to it nor take anything from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before Him. In, in Ecclesiastes 2.14, or 3.14. Yeah, read the next verse. Verse 15, That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Everything has always been in the mind of God from forever, and it always will be. And that's why He said in Isaiah... 46 and 10. I'm the Lord, there's none beside me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I'll do all my pleasure, I'll do what I please, and nobody can stop me from doing that, so relax. Yeah. Take it easy, man. It doesn't matter what comes, because all things are working together for good to them that love the Lord. Hey, Jim, hey. you're talking about how, how you're being one and being single and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That goes along too. I think it's in John there where it says, and when we see Him, we'll be as Yeah, First John three and one. Yeah. Yes. The whole manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we will be like Him. Wonderful, isn't it? Great. For we shall see Him as He is. What did you say? Yes. We see through a glass darkly. Now, we don't understand these things. Be thankful for the predestination of God. Read 17, did you say, Mary? And I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. That's why he said in, in Ephesians 1 and 11, we have obtained an inheritance. It's the kingdom of light. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now here, I want to say this. Faith believes it when God says, you have been pro -horizoed. Now I know a lot of people say, I believe in predestination. Not if you don't obey predestination. Oh Lord. Uh oh, no me. It's heavy. Now watch this. How do we get faith? Huh? Let me erase some things. Wh where does faith come from? Yeah, but what does the Bible say? Faith. Yeah, that's good. What was that you said? Romans 10 and 17. Faith cometh by hearing. Yeah, akuo. Thank you. And you know what that means? You know what the word akuo means? A-K-O-U-O. The word akuo means to. To hear in intelligently. Now let's go to the Old Testament word for hear. To hear intelligently to the Jewish mind meant to obey. Now, 
The Old Testament word for hear. Proverbs 20 and 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord has made even both of them. If you could hear and see the truth, it's because you got sheep ears. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees in John 10? They said, how long will thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, they said, use P-A-R-H-E-S-S-I-A. Parhesia, that is the word plainly, and that's the same word that Paul used. That's the same word that Paul used when he said, seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech over there in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness. The word plainness is, is the word parhesia. It comes from pos, and E-R-E-O, ereo. Pos is the word all... And a rail means command or commandment. Use all of the commandment of God, and it means use cutting, abrasive words. Cut to the heart. Don't ever use enticing words. Never. Paul said, I didn't come with enticing words. Didn't he say that in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians? But in the power and the demonstration of the Spirit, of the truth. He said, I'm not here to make anybody happy. I had a real estate broker said, Now, Jim, if you'll be nicer and listen to everybody else's opinion, uh, you could get more people to follow you. I'm not trying to get people to follow me. I'm trying the best I can to say the truth as plain as I can say it if nobody believes. I'm not... I, what did he say? He said, they said, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. He said, I already told you plainly over in John 8. He said this in John 10, John 8. He said, I am, I am. How, can, how plain can you get? I am the I am. I'm God. And they took up stones to stone him in, in John 8. And they said, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. They're just looking for another excuse to kill, kill Jesus. And they got one, and they did. But they did for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel term, determined before they be done. They did their evil will. They did the will of God. The kings were there that day, Herod and Pilate. Acts 4 and 26 and 27. Pilate was there. Herod was there. The Gentiles were there. The Roman soldiers were there piercing his side. They were all there. And the Jews were there screaming, Crucify him! And the next verse said, They did for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And that word determined is the word prohorizo, predestinate. You know what they did? They obeyed the will of God. Now, I don't understand how men can... They did their evil deed. They did sin. They murdered Christ. But Jesus said, I lay down my life. He let Satan go into their hearts and even actually arranged the thoughts and the minds and the intents of their hearts so that they would put him to death. Now, try to understand that you never will. Yeah. And Pilate said, huh? That's right. He told Pilate, he said, you can't. Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to release you? She said, you don't have any power except it's given to you and my Father which you never. You have no power. And he sought from that day forth to release him. They couldn't. And then Jesus goes on to say, he said, I told you plainly. He said, you will not believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Hear. Hear. They hear my voice and they know me and they follow me and I give my sheep eternal life and I don't give goats eternal life and turn them into sheep. This is not a biolog biological miracle. Now what he was saying when he said, my sheep hear, that's H-A-M-A. That is the, that is the Old Testament word for hear. And by the way, it is also the Old Testament word for H-E-A-R-K. E-N-E-T-H. And it is also the Old Testament word for obey. You look up obey in your concordance and every time you find it, every time in the Old Testament, it is the word shama. So to hear is to obey. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith comes by obedience to the Word of God. We're saved by grace through faith that obeys the Word of God. That's why the verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained. pro e t i o m a z o p r o pro e t i o m a z o pro e t i o m a z o It means to fit up in advance. It means to fit in advance. And He's ordained... 
He's ordained that He is before ordained. He has fitted us in advance. What has He fitted us with? With hearing ears. We got sheep ears and we can hear sheep food. The word law is the word nomos. And it means legal food for sheep. Do you know sheep will eat any of the Word of God you give them? Huh? Any of it. And there's nothing written in God's Word that's going to offend God's sheep. They will eat nomos when Jesus said to Peter, Peter! Agatha, O thou... More than, Agatha, O thou me, more than these. He used the verb form, A-G-A-P-E-O. He said, if you agape me, feed my sheep, because all of the law, this word nomos is the Greek word for the word law, and it means legal food for sheep. And he said, feed my sheep. And, he, and Peter said, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Jesus said, Peter... Lovest thou me more than these? Do you really agape me? And he said, Lord, you know I feel I owe you. You know I have an affection for you. Jesus said the third time, he said, Peter, do you feel I owe me? Peter was grieved in his heart. He began to weep because he remembered the third time he had denied Jesus. He said, Lord, you know I feel I owe you. Jesus said, if you have any affection for me, you got to love my words. Take the agape to the sheep. And all the law is fulfilled by agape. And you have to die to self. Faith. Faith cometh by hearing. And what is faith? Faith is obedience to God's Word. It has to die to self. And that's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews... Let me erase some of this. Boy, this stuff is getting run together. Hebrews 11 and 1. Here it is. Faith is the substance. If Here, let's write it down this way. Can we say faith cometh by hearing? Huh? Let's put faith. Faith is hearing. Okay? And let's put faith is obedience. Now, we are not saved by works. We're saved by a working faith. And how? what is faith? Well, it's hearing. It's obedience. It comes by hearing. you got to have sheep ears to hear. You don't have goat ears and you turn into a sheep. Faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Here is the definition for faith throughout the Scriptures. Even the, old, even the old scholars will tell you, this is it right here. Right here. Faith is substance and faith let me put a little space there put a little space between these and faith faith is evidence and what is the word substance thank you it's T-A-S-I-S and what does that mean under under or through under or through. Now here it is. Now Fred Price's substance means stuff. Yeah. Fred Price has got rocks in his head. He needs to define the Bible. He needs to define the Word of God. That's what Kenneth Copeland says. He says, he says substance. Well, I, well, I heard Fred Price say one night. He said substance. That cars and Cadillacs and stakes and gold and money and stuff. No, it's not, Freddie. Pay attention. I can't believe these people. Under or through the stasis. Stasis, oh me. S-T-A-S-I-S. Let me show you something here. Stasis, we get the word sta-o. We get the word, I'm going to have to move this. Let's put evidence somewhere else, okay? We got the word sta-o. H-I-S-T-E-M-I. You got the word S-T-A-U-R-O-O. These are all derivations of this word. These two right here are actually the same word, and I'll show you. Then you've got the word S-T-A, or S-T-A, wait a minute, S-T-A-U-R-A-O-S, Staros. Now, and let me give you this. I haven't put this one in here. S-T-E-R-E-O. Okay? 
that looks like stereo, but it's stereo. And we got some other words that goes with it. These are all derivations, same same word. This word stao, what does that mean? Stand. What's the word histame? Y'all tell me. Histame? Upright. 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 Now, for several hundred years before Jesus was born, a daily expression back then would say, that man is upright. He stands for what he believes. He's an upright man. It meant he was honest. It meant that he would, that he was martus, martyr, we get the word witness from the word martus, M-A-R-T-U-S, and that comes from M-A-R-T-Y-R, and that's the word witness. And Ricky Skaggs got on TV and said, silent witness. How in the world can you be a silent witness? Look over and said, that guy is silent and he looks like a Christian. Let's go kill him. N- no. Jesus died for his words. Paul died for his words. Peter died for his words. James died for his words. All the prophets died for their words. The apostles died for their words. And even the fathers of the church said that John, after he was after he got through his exile on Patmos, that they killed him eventually. We didn't know that, did we? Now the word stero. What's that? Crucify. And the word staros, that's the word cross. Sometimes I'll say this is cross. It's all the same. Some are the verb. That's the verb. Cross is the noun. This is the this is the verb. This is the noun. This is the verb. This is the noun. And this word stereo, you remember when when in, in the Hebrews, the fifth chapter? You remember Hebrews 5 that uh, Paul said, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. I won't go into it right now. But the writer said, strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. Oh, man. In the word full age, we get into the word teleos, teleates, which is the word perfection, which means to be completed. And he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to complete his people. And that word stereo is the word strong meat. You can't eat steak until you grow up. And that's why he said some of you need to go back and be put on milk and you cannot have crucifying me. The ability to die and to stand upright and to crucify self and to take your cross daily. And Jesus said, if you don't take your cross, you cannot be my disciple. Let me tell you, they may not be, they, this nation is going to have a very few Christians. They, I don't hear this, I don't even hear this being preached. You gotta die to get to heaven. That's called faith. You gotta die to self and believe God. You gotta obey predestination. Predestination is prohorizo, pre-lightened, predetermined that one walk in the light. And how many times have I given us these words? Gosh. Horizo comes from the word horion. That means to bound. And every time you find the word coast or coast, we're talking about the coast of Judea. Our coast of the United States is it's the Atlantic, the Pacific. Uh, oh man, Kelsey's Creek, oh man, Kelsey's Woods. <laughs> I just had to say it. <laughs> As Ernest T. Bass. <laughs> oh man, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, our uh, our uh, our coast is Atlantic, Pacific, Canada, Mexico, Gulf. That's our. Horace, limit, boundary line. That comes from the word. Whew. That comes from the word hercos, means to take an oath to, and you have to take an oath to the United States to live by their laws. You got to pay your taxes. You can't go speeding down the road. If you do, you get a ticket. You can't kill somebody. You go to jail. That all these come from the word horizo. You get the word hercos or horos. Or herkos means to fence in or limit. And we have to, we're limited. We're fenced into the United States. What we can do, and all these words, herkos, horos, horion, horos, they come from that word. Well, the word herkos means to fence in. And we're fenced into the United States, and you're fenced into the light. 
the boundary of God and you have to obey God. And how do you do that? You don't have any ability to do it. You have to die. You have to be upright. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stan, H-I-S-T-E-M-I, histomai, that means upright. The Old Testament equivalent of that word is T-A-M-I-Y-M. Tomim, and that word, what does that mean? 